Hello there. Welcome back to our Sky Tonight program. My name is Seth Mayo. I'm the curator of astronomy for the Loma Planetarium at MOAS. And in this edition of the show, we're covering the dates of December 20th through December 26th. We'll start things off by talking about the winter solstice that occurs early this week. Then we'll provide an update on Comet Leonard, where to find it in the sky, what your observed chances are, and where you're going to see it end up as we go through the end of the year. And we'll talk about the exciting James Webb Space Telescope that will hopefully launch soon and discuss how it may change your understanding of the universe. So let's get to it. This Tuesday, December 21st, we can celebrate our December solstice. For us in the Northern Hemisphere, this is the beginning of wintertime. If you're in the Southern Hemisphere, this is the beginning of summertime. Of course, the seasons are opposite between the North and Southern Hemispheres. So from our perspective in the Northern Hemisphere, this is when the sun sits lowest in the sky. Generally, we have the shortest day and longest night at this time of the year. And this is also when we are tilted farthest from the sun because Earth's tilt is what causes the seasons, not our proximity to the sun. Interestingly enough, we're actually closer to the sun in December than we are in our summertime. I always thought that was an interesting characteristic between our orbit and our season. So since Earth is tilted with respect to the Earth's orbit around the sun, our planet receives varying amounts of energy throughout the year, which causes fluctuations in our seasons. Now, the precise moment for our solstice this year is at 1559 Greenwich Mean Time or Universal Time. If you want to translate that to East Coast Time where we are, that's about 10.59 a.m., so in the morning is the, is the precise moment for the solstice this time around. And as you may already know, the word solstice is Latin for the sun to stand still. Because as the year goes on, it seems like the sun is moving up and down the sky, and at its extreme high and low points, it almost seems to pause. And a long ago, people actually noticed that pausing effect that occurs and a lot of celebration happened. This was a transition time of the year and we're still having those celebrations today as you watch that play out. And we can actually see that movement here in Stellarium if we actually turn on our date and time, we can kind of watch that happen. And the sun seems to trace a figure eight pattern in the sky, what we now call an analemma. And you can kind of see it in here if we progress forward many, many days, but keep it at the same time. So let's do that now. We'll move past our December solstice here for this year. And as we do, you'll see the sun now round up and get higher in the sky. We'll move through the equinox and then get into the summer solstice where the sun sits highest in the sky. It seems to pause at that very high point when Earth is most tilted towards the sun. And then we're gonna continue from here. That's going to round down now, going through the September equinox. And then we'll make our way back to the winter solstice once again when the sun seems to pause at its lowest point in the sky. So it's always fun to kind of watch that play out and you can see that figure eight pattern that shows us the varying altitudes of the sun throughout the year. So we'll say happy December solstice for everybody, happy winter solstice for the northern hemisphere and happy summer solstice for the southern hemisphere. And it's always great to appreciate the change in the seasons. For those comet hunters out there, we still have an exciting chance to see Comet Leonard that is now gracing our evening sky. And this comet, this icy rocky object, was probably last seen 80,000 years ago. It was actually as far out as 3,500 astronomical units away from the sun. That is 3,500 times the Earth-Sun distance, and it took 35,000 years to finally make its way from there to the inner solar system where it's now feeling the heat and energy from the sun and lighting up. It was discovered early this year and it quickly got our attention this past fall when it started brightening and developing a tail and has definitely become the best comet to see for 2021, especially through binoculars or a telescope. In early December, Comet Leonard was in our early morning sky towards the east and quickly heading towards the eastern horizon. And each morning it was moving closer and closer to the sun and brightening up as it moved past that bright star Arcturus and continuing until December 12th when it got closest to Earth at about 21 million miles away. And more recently on December 17th and 18th, Comet Leonard reached its closest position to the brightest planet in our sky, Venus, just above the southwestern horizon that you see there. 
And if you happen to be at Venus floating above its thick carbon dioxide atmosphere around that time, you would have had a spectacular view of this comet. So here in Stellarium, we can actually change our location, even our planetary location, and go to Venus and see what that would have looked like. We'll put ourselves in a position where the comet would be best seen, and there it is. It shows this kind of neat little comet graphic here. So from that point of view, from Venus's point of view, Comet Leonard was only 2.6 million miles away. So this was a lot, lot closer. It would have been very bright in the sky there and definitely visible to your naked eyes. Heading back to Earth here on Monday, December 20th, we're gonna find Comet Leonard just above the southwestern horizon, not long after sunset, and to the left of Venus now, a little bit farther than it was on December 17th and 18th. So you can find Venus here to the right, and then there's Saturn a bit above it, and then Jupiter. So it's nice to have these bright planets as reference points to maybe help you to locate where Comet Leonard is located. So this is on Monday, but we'll continue through the week here to go to Tuesday. And then Wednesday, the 22nd, you'll see it get a little higher and move a little bit farther south. We'll continue on to the 23rd. And then by the 24th on Christmas Eve, you're actually gonna find Comet Leonard reach its highest altitude above the horizon. So around this time may be a good time to try to look out for this. And then we'll continue on into Christmas on the 25th on Saturday and then the 26th on Sunday. It's moved farther south even more, but now is starting to descend closer to the horizon again. But you may have a chance to see it. So you do have to balance between the time of evening it is, not too close to sunset, but also when it's not too low in the sky because things that are lower are more obscured by the atmosphere. So you have a little more fuzz and muck that you have to look through, so that's a bit of a challenge, but it may still be bright enough to see through that. Now, so far from reports from observers, this comet hasn't been visible to the naked eye for most people. It may have for some if you're in a really, really dark location, but for many, it's been best viewed through a telescope or even binoculars. Binoculars are a great choice. Most people have access to them. You don't need anything too fancy or too large. Just a simple pair of binoculars may give you a decent enough view of this. But if you do have a telescope, even better, and you can possibly even take a picture of it and get a really, really nice view of Comet Leonard. So that's probably the best way of viewing it. So we will see, and as we go through the week, it's actually still getting closer and closer to the sun. And what will happen is as we get to the new year, specifically on January 3rd of the new year, that is actually when Comet Leonard reaches perihelion. That is when it's about 60% the Earth-Sun distance, so about 0.6 AU. So this is not a sun grazing comet. So there's probably not a chance for it to really break up like Comet Ison did back in 2013. If you remember that comet, that was supposed to be the comet of the century. And that comet got within 1.2% the Earth's sun distance and it actually broke apart and got disintegrated by the intense radiation from the sun. This is much farther away, but still getting closer so it possibly could be getting brighter and brighter. And there are some reports that it has been getting a bit brighter and it may show signs of activity or outbursts as it continues its perihelion approach to the sun. So we have to wait and see. Comets are notoriously unpredictable. They're very exciting to follow because you never know what's gonna happen. So it may dim, it may brighten, it may stay the same. We're not entirely sure, but definitely keep an eye out for the southwest after sunset as this comet gets a little higher this week and then starts to descend a bit closer to the sun near perihelion. This week we definitely wanted to mention that we're in the midst of the launch of one of the most important tools or instruments for astronomy, astrophysics, cosmology, or really all of science ever to be launched in human history. And that, of course, is of the James Webb Space Telescope, which you may have been hearing about lately. There's been a lot of hype around this new observatory in space. And this is not hyperbole saying all this. This new space telescope may transform our understanding of the universe, allowing us to see things we had never before, which is truly exciting to think about. And the James Webb Space Telescope is considered the successor to that very well-known and beloved Hubble Space Telescope, which is amazingly still in orbit around the Earth and functioning after more than 30 years. Hubble has had that very unique vantage point being about 340 miles above the Earth's surface, above most of that obscuring atmosphere that surrounds us, 
giving it a crystal clear view of the universe never seen before. And the school bus size observatory has done so much over the years after it was launched in 1990 aboard the space shuttle Discovery, and of course went through a series of fixes and improvements by scientists, technicians, and even astronauts that visited this space telescope over the years and helping to improve its optics and its reliability so we could use it for these more than 30 years. And most of us have probably seen at least a picture or two, if not many, observations captured by this great observatory over the years and through its history Hubble has shown us planets within our solar system in really interesting ways. We've seen those beautiful and amazing nebulous vistas where stars and planets are being born, where stars are dying, even the remnants of stellar explosions called supernova in many different stages. We've also seen gorgeous views of galaxies, galaxy collisions. We've watched as galaxies are moving farther and farther away as they're redshifting, showing us that expanding universe and the universe is accelerating in its expansion, which has also helped us refine the age of our universe to 13.8 billion years. We've used the space telescope to look at little dark pockets of the universe, showing us that every tiny dark speck, if you expose long enough, is filled with countless galaxies in a series of deep field images that are truly unprecedented, helping us to see farther into the universe and further back in time, allowing us to piece together more of the history of our universe since the Big Bang. So Hubble has been truly extraordinary in its observations of the universe near and far, and it continues to do so today. But as great as this observatory is, Hubble is limited by its aging instruments, the size of its primary mirror, and the kinds of wavelengths of light that it can see in the universe. And that's where the James Webb Space Telescope comes into play. It is another space telescope, but sits much farther from the Earth. Hubble is more than 340 miles above the Earth's surface. For James Webb, it's going to be situated more than a million miles away from the Earth, even farther away than where the moon lies, in an area called the L2 Lagrange point. That is an interesting location in our solar system where the Earth and Sun's gravity kind of cancel out, and you have a very stable place to put an instrument like the James Webb Space Telescope. And in that location, this new observatory can orbit around L2 and always face away from the Earth and the Sun. And the reason for that is because this observatory is a infrared telescope. The infrared light or the heat from the Earth, the Sun, and even the Moon can interfere with the observations made by James Webb. So that's why it sits at L2 kind of facing away from those objects. But it's also why this telescope has a very large sun shield, the size of a tennis court approximately. There are five very thin layers of material that are as thin as a human hair. That acts as a sun shield from those other objects in the solar system to protect the optics and the instruments aboard James Webb. The temperature needs to be at about 50 Kelvin or below. That's about negative 370 degrees Fahrenheit. So very cold temperatures that this telescope needs to operate in. And this provides the ideal conditions for the observing and the type of observations that are needed to be made by this great instrument. One very exciting aspect and improvement for James Webb is that it's about 100 times more powerful than Hubble. And that is mainly due to the size of its light gathering area. There are a series of 18 hexagonal mirrors that make one large one. And if you compare it to Hubble, the Hubble Space Telescope has about a 2.4 meter or 7.8 foot diameter primary mirror. That's pretty big. But you compare it to James Webb that has a 6.5 meter or 21.3 foot diameter light gathering area. That is a whole lot bigger. And it is true for telescopes that bigger truly is better. These smaller mirrors are made up of beryllium that is very strong and very lightweight and is coated in gold, which is a very good reflector of infrared light. And that's primarily what James Webb can see. And Hubble can see in a little bit of the near infrared, but mainly in visible light and in ultraviolet light. That is what it's suited for. For James Webb, it sees a little bit in visible light, mostly reds, but then also near infrared and in the mid infrared portion of that spectrum. 
So that's why this needs to be very cold and also for its size. If you have longer wavelength of light, you need a larger telescope to see it. But with a larger light gathering area, you can increase the resolving power, allowing you to see things clear in higher resolution and much, much farther away. And this will truly be game changing. And with its four primary instruments that can see in various wavelengths of the infrared, and have spectrometers that can detect the elements and the molecules that are found in all sorts of objects within the universe. All of this creates an unprecedented instrument that is gonna be truly game-changing when it comes to our understanding of the universe. And what will that allow us to do? Allow us to see objects within our solar system in great detail. We can also see through the dust and gas of nebula like never before, allowing us to reveal the mysteries of stellar birth and also where planets are being born. And what's really, really intriguing and exciting to think about is that James Webb will be able to look at the atmosphere of tiny exoplanet worlds around other stars, possibly detecting elements that could signal life on those worlds. But not only that, James Webb can look at galaxies in the early part of our universe. Galaxies, when they first form long ago, shine very bright in ultraviolet, but as they've redshifted or moved farther away, the light gets stretched into the infrared. And now James Webb is looking at that light, seeing objects and galaxies as young as 200 million years after the Big Bang. We've never looked that far or that far back in time ever before. And more of the information will help us to piece together an even more accurate picture of the history of the universe that we live in. And this is just scratching the surface of what Webb can do. It's going to unlock so many mysteries and answer questions that we haven't even asked yet. The good thing is we can combine data from James Webb and Hubble and other observatories in space or on the ground here on Earth to provide a more complete picture of what we're looking at. Now the scary and humbling part of all of this is actually launching this space telescope to L2. Now, at the time of recording this video, the launch date was set for December 24th. So hopefully it launches by then. This has been delayed many, many times due to the complications of building and constructing a telescope like this. This has been many years in the making just to get this thing launched and put into space and we have one try. And what's kind of crazy about this instrument is it's so big, there's really only one rocket in the world that was able to hold this in its fairing and launch it and that is an Ariane 5 rocket from the European Space Administration that will be launched in French Guiana in South America. And so again, that's supposed to launch at the time of the recording of this video on December 24th, but who knows, that could change. And to actually launch something like this, the whole telescope had to be designed to be folded up. The sun shield is actually folded 12 times over and the mirrors are folded as well in a very intricate and complicated piece of origami that fits inside the fairing of the Ariane 5 rocket and then is launched. And in the month that this telescope takes to get to L2, it's gonna be slowly unfolding different elements one section at a time. And this is the part that's really gonna be nail biting and nerve wracking for scientists and technicians that have spent years or their whole career designing this. At first you're gonna have the solar panels deploy and then the sun shield will deploy at different stages very, very carefully, which provides that heat protection that we mentioned earlier. And then over time, the mirror elements will be unfolded. The secondary mirror and the primary mirror will be carefully unfolded as well. And so that will take about a month for that to happen as it travels to L2. And then once it gets there, it has to cool down. The instruments have to be calibrated and the telescope has to be focused as well. And so that's gonna take some time, possibly about six months for all of that to occur to make sure that James Webb will perform the way it's intended to. And once we get first light from this, that will hopefully be the beginning to a new era of our understanding and our exploration of the universe. So that whole launch and deployment, there is only one try. Once this is put out there, we can't really save it. There's no spacecraft that can go there and fix it like with Hubble because it's much farther away from Earth. So this one is a bit more scary. There's a lot more on the line for the launch. So hopefully that all goes well because this has taken years. The ideas for this were first developed in 1989. And since then it's been designed, built, new technologies have actually been invented. There's even been spin-offs these are technologies that are improving other industries and other commercial enterprise and other research that have come out from the design and the building 
of James Webb. So with all the teamwork and the thousands of individuals that put their time to this, all of the inventions and the innovative technology that had to be developed for this, this is one of the greatest scientific missions ever undertaken. And this is a joint effort by NASA, the European Space Administration, and Canada, and of course, research institutions and other countries around the world. So it's always great to see so many people come together to make this happen. So here's to a launch that happens soon and one that happens successfully and according to plan to hopefully bring about one of the greatest tools we'll ever use to study our universe. Well, that's it for another edition of our Sky Tonight program. Thank you very much for tuning in. And if you're in the area in Daytona Beach, please stop by the Museum of Arts and Sciences. We have so many great exhibits on display for you to enjoy. And definitely stop by the Loman Planetarium. We are running shows every day. So please check our schedule online for any more information about those programs. With that being said, hope you all have a happy holidays. We'll also say go James Webb Space Telescope. And of course, Happy stargazing.